Thanks, Stacey, and thanks everyone for signing in. Um, we'll try and share some ideas and some tips today that hopefully will be helpful. Uh, and as Stacey said, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, and if there are any that occur to you as we go through, please do use the chat box. Um, so today's session is about assessment and plugging the gaps, specifically identifying gaps in skills and knowledge using I primary and I lower secondary. Um, and I'm going to explore the issues facing schools around the world as they return to teaching post COVID. Uh, whatever students experiences during the difficult past three months, all will have had their learning affected in some way. Um, we're going to look at how to identify gaps in skills and knowledge and discuss identifying those gaps that are truly important. We're going to look at some practical things around how to use the curriculum and the assessments within IPLS to identify gaps and how the planning and other resources can help address those gaps. Um, so first up, very quickly, uh, me, I guess, uh, your presenter. So my name's Kevin Hyatt. Um, Apparently you have to put a picture of yourself on these things, but I have literally any excuse to show my horse and to not show a close-up of my own face or my lockdown hair. Uh, so I'm a senior publisher at Pearson at Excel, working in the international curriculum. Uh, previously, I taught English abroad. I was a primary school teacher and senior leader in the UK for 12 years, and I've worked as an educational charity and an educational consultancy and publishing. Okay, on to the better stuff. Um, I say better. Um, Okay, so as the header says, we live in unprecedented times. Uh, you'll know as well, if not better than me, the challenges facing schools and pupils at this time. The current pandemic has had significant effects on schools and on pupils' education. Staff and pupil illness, school closures, um, and a shift to remote and blended teaching and learning have all disrupted our normal ways of educating and of tracking just where pupils are they might have contributed to gaps in knowledge and understanding between pupils in the same cohort, um, between a whole class and the curriculum, where they're expected to be, and they might have widened existing gaps as well, especially for disadvantaged groups. Although we are too close to issues to really understand the total impact at this point, there has been some research. Uh, the Education Endowment Fund in the UK, for example, believes that School closures are likely to reverse progress made to narrow gaps in attainment made in the last decade. They believe educate, uh, effective remote teaching will mitigate the extent to which the gaps widen. And they very clearly state that support is going to be needed to help pupils, particularly disadvantaged pupils, catch up with where they should be. And although remote teaching has progressed rapidly in its scope and effectiveness, uh, there does still exist gaps that might have developed during those first few months and trying to investigate and address those gaps while not neglecting students ongoing needs is the point of this webinar. So firstly we're going to have a look at how to identify the gaps in learning. So this is a summary slide of the things we're going to go into a little more detail about and many of the ideas here are simple. Uh, but the application of them requires a lot of dedication and it's likely there's no one-size-fits-all approach from subject to subject or even from student to student. Whatever curriculum you do follow, these are the common steps you can take and of course they're not the only steps, you may well have your own ideas and own methods as well. Look at your curriculum, look at the lesson planning, look at test results before, during and since the closures, look at ongoing tracking and assessments from previous years, Formative assessment, questioning, conversation with students are going to be your best tool to identify gaps. And large baseline tests, we'll talk about those as well, and they are an option, but results might well be complex, and we'll talk about some of the issues surrounding them. So firstly, I mentioned the curriculum. Look at the curriculum you're following. What are the expectations and objectives for that year or key stage? And what are the expectations from the previous year? Ideally, a student should come to you knowing everything from the previous year. How likely that is or not is up for debate, but this document, the curriculum, will also provide a use useful tool for you to track against. Since I primary and I lower secondary have year by year related, uh, age related expectations, you've already got a ready made progression map telling you where a child is coming from where they should be now and where they're going, 
You can see at the bottom of the screen the, uh, an example of the level of detail provided there. So this is a small selection of the year one objectives for maths. Look at lesson planning. This might seem simple, but if school was closed for three months from March, and during those three months students were meant to study inference in English or quadratic equations in maths, there's a good chance those are going to be weak areas now. You can see the curriculum objectives section there in both lesson plans and the schemes of work. So here is lesson plans, here is the scheme of work. Um, and as we said, if it was missed completely or taught in an unfamiliar way, so the first few weeks about remote teaching, it's worth checking the understanding. So these are likely to be gaps. And I'm looking specifically at the weeks I know were missed. And look at test results and ask to see results and marks and tracking from previous year groups. If a student went into the pandemic finding a topic or a skill tricky, they're fairly unlikely to have made up existing gaps without your intervention. Your school might have mark books or ongoing tracking that follows a child from year to year. This could be online or offline, uh, complex or simple. As previously mentioned, the curriculum document itself provides an opportunity to track a child's attainment. If your school doesn't already have something in place, it can be tricky, but this is your opportunity to get something in place. And it's something that senior leadership and teachers in subsequent years will really appreciate as well. And when we're looking at those test results uh, before, during, since the closures, they really do need to be mapped to the curriculum because there's a limit to what a raw number can tell us. It might be able to give us an indicative grade for the future, but if we're using it as a tool to identify gaps, um, a simple number doesn't tell us much. We need to know which curriculum objectives it maps to. And then it's likely that a lot of the information and data that you need won't already be collected. And we all know that you don't have to formally test a student to know they can do something. Quizzes, questionnaires, or simple conversation with students will help contribute to the picture of what they can and cannot do. Um, if, a, if a young child retells familiar stories in class uh, or repeatedly answers questions during whole class teaching, that tells me as a professional very clearly which skills they've mastered. It means I can focus my teaching on other areas, areas where there are gaps. We need to have confidence in our own judgments as professionals and confident in each other's judgments as well. Um, it can seem overwhelming, but it helps with this formative assessment to focus on a small group of children at a time um, and to focus on particular objectives as well. And if you have an additional adult or teaching assistant in your class, give them really specific instructions. Say, could you please watch this group of children and look at these objectives? I'm asking you to collect evidence about whether they can do it or not. And then the final way that we can gather information is a baseline test. <clears throat> now, a single large baseline test at the start of the year is an attractive idea. Surely if a student sits a test on last year's content or this year's content to date, that will tell me what they do and don't know. It, it's a very attractive idea that it can all be done in one go like that, but it does present a few difficulties. The first is, end of year tests, which baselines are often based upon, almost never test everything for Matt Year's teaching. They test a relatively randomized selection of content. The student is encouraged to revise because they know anything could come up. But as a post-event diagnostic tool, they're limited by this. You're only testing what you're testing. If you want to create a test creating everything, that is going to be a very, very, very long test. And if we do create such a long test, particularly with young children, are we now absolutely certain we're testing the student skills and knowledge, or are we testing their ability to concentrate on a four or five hour test, or their ability to answer exam style questions? The second, the exam style questions, is still a valuable skill, 
but it's perhaps not the one we're looking at at this point. We're looking at curriculum gaps. So what matters? From all of the gaps and all of the things they might have missed and we don't have evidence for, um, what's actually important? Well, the temptation is to say everything matters. And when I was teaching, I know I'd feel slightly annoyed if the year above decided something I taught or was meant to teach wasn't important. But we have to be practical and realistic about this. Ultimately, you as professionals have to decide what is or isn't the most important. The first section when we're looking at what's important is skills. Skills such as the inference of a character's intention, of the ability to construct a fair test, or to be able to apply mathematical skills in a particular context and apply them are much more important than the ability to infer that character's intentions or to construct that fair test. If you're already confident that a student has mastered inference, I can show you this. Does it actually matter that they missed your chance to do this last term in a very specific context? I'd argue no, it doesn't. Does it matter in science if I know uh, the shape of a particular leaf? If I can definitely make clear observations and create clear scientific diagrams? Again, no. Don't forget that we as teachers are often hanging skills off knowledge because that's the easiest way to teach them rather than knowledge itself always being the most important thing. Saying that, underlying or prior knowledge is still important. Not knowledge for its own sake. You've got enough to do with this year's teaching without trying to tell children exactly what happened on page 78 of the storybook they missed last term. But sometimes you do need to know something to enable you to access new learning. For example, if I want to be able to multiply and divide effectively by 10, 100 or 1000, I need an understanding of place value. Each of the IPLS lesson plans you've got access to has a section on prior knowledge and the curriculum itself helps to create a progression map you can check here. Often we only look at the curriculum for our year group. But I'm going to say again, it's really important, especially in these times, to have a look at where they've come from and have a look at last year's curriculum to help you identify gaps as well. And what I'm saying in both of these cases is that the important thing is to move students on, but that we need to do so without ignoring fundamental gaps. If you want a student to revise, redo, to do absolutely everything they missed in the last three months. Well, then you need to bring them to school every evening and weekend and teach them that extra three months of content exactly as it is. Clearly, that's not a good idea. Use your professionalism and common sense to look ahead and identify the key skills and knowledge your students are going to need in order to move on. However, saying that, if you are teaching a high stake exam year, like international GCSE or international A-level, then this is made really simple for you in some ways. In those cases, look at the specification, look at the things which are very likely to come up in the exam and ensure these often knowledge rich chunks of content are taught. These heavily knowledge based in examinations do affect life chances. And when employers, universities are looking at that in the future, they'll look at those raw grades. If you're lucky enough to not be teaching a high stakes exam year, then absolutely look at the longer term and focus on the skills and underlying knowledge you need to move children on. You'll have higher achieving and more engaged students in the long run. OK, so that's all very well. I'm going to have a look now at some ideas and some practical advice as well. So what this actually looks like in practice. <clears throat> so uh, first up, we said use the curriculum. So your school might have mark books or ongoing tracking that follows a child from year to year. As I said, it could be online, it could be an offline mark book, complex or simple. But as I've already said, simply writing down marks 
doesn't necessarily tell us a lot in itself though. It might say uh, Kevin is an average child, Stacy is high achieving, but it doesn't tell me about specific graps, uh, gaps. If your school already tracks achievement, test marks and teacher assessment directly against the curriculum, brilliant. Then you've already got a really good picture into what children can do and what they can't. And we mentioned the curriculum. The curriculum does form the basis for everything. It tells you where they've come from, where they should be now, or what they're working towards, and where they're heading. Each of the I primary and I lower secondary curricula give you a clear progression you can track children against and a running record that can follow that child all the way through school. Useful now and useful in the future. And if your school doesn't already have something in place, this is your opportunity to get something in place. Print out the curriculum document. A copy for each child is ideal. It goes up with them, you don't give it to them, it's your document. And highlight what children can already definitely do. Going forwards, as you test and teach further, highlight and date. When you're confident a child understands or has mastered something, the dating will be really useful as they move through the school. It'll tell you if a child is on track, trying to catch up, or moving ahead. And make life easier for yourself. Having to look at a whole year's curriculum for every child right from the beginning is a lot of work. So start with the scheme of work. We can see it here. So um, <clears throat> you should be able to work out which weeks or units have been missed. Um, and last year's teacher will be a big help with this. Focus on these objectives to start with in the curriculum. Do you have evidence? Are you confident the child has mastered them? So here, I know they've missed year five, term two, week one. So these are the first ones I'm going to look at evidence for, gathering evidence for. And do use the curriculum as your running record though, and highlight the curriculum, not the scheme of work. Because in the scheme of work, objectives come up multiple times and are retaught, and it can get really easy to be confused. Here, I'm just using it to say, these are the objectives I will look at in the curriculum to start with. So in practice, here we are. I've printed off the curriculum. This is primary math, maths. I'm a year six teacher, so I'm quickly looking at year five. Things the child should really know before they get to me. I've used all the things we've already talked about existing tests, my knowledge of the child, conversation with the previous teacher. In fact, it's excellent practice to do this with the previous year's teacher. Sit down together. Yes, it's a big job the first time you do it. Sit down together remotely, I should say. Uh, it's a big job the first time you do it, but so helpful and really quick in the future. I put all of this together and I've highlighted what I'm confident the child can do. And I've also written their name on it because after all, this is a running record that will go with them all the way through school. And I focused on the objectives that I know were in the term the child missed school. You can see there's one objective on this page I haven't highlighted. I've got no evidence they can do this. So what do I do now? Well, firstly, you need to use your professional judgment. Is this something the child needs to know or master in order to access content this year or in the future? Well, to me, this sounds like a, a pretty vital place value and number knowledge um, item that will underpin other things. But if I'm not certain, I'm going to talk to colleagues in the same year groups. Um, I might talk to colleagues in other year groups. I might talk to colleagues teaching the same subject or the subject coordinator as well. And remember, if the student has definitely mastered a certain skill, going back to the example of creating a fair test in science, there's not necessarily much point in going over it again, just for the sake of covering missed lessons. I really suspect everybody's going to have enough to do anyway. But if this objective is vital, what now? Well, firstly, don't leap ahead too quickly. Carry on mapping skills and knowledge for this child and for the rest of the class as well. 
In some ways, it's going to make your life easier if you can identify whether a gap applies to just one child, the whole class, or to certain groups. Once you've done this mapping for other children, you can gather more evidence. It may be that the child or, ch child or children can do it, but you just don't know yet. And then finally, you can teach this objective. This is going to generally follow gathering more evidence, unless I'm pretty certain they definitely can't do it. So here we are with the objective identified that Kevin can't do, or at least that's wrong, but I don't have evidence for Kevin being able to do. And I've also discovered a small number of other children who I don't have evidence for either. I don't know they can't, otherwise I'd just leap straight ahead to teaching it. So what now? So I'm going to gather more evidence. At the moment, this is a single isolated objective. It's not a whole group of objectives from a term terminal topic. So I'm going to ask targeted questions, and these can be oral or written to check understanding. I might set supervised, and it's supervised because you want to see evidence, group work to check understanding. And in some cases, if it's appropriate, I might do something as simple as ask the child to explain the idea or the concept. If I'm missing evidence for a large number of objectives, however, from a missed term or topic, then more options are also opening up. I can use the progress test for that term. So in fact, if I'm lacking any evidence at all for a whole half term, IPLS have progress tests for each subject for each half term, and they're all mapped directly to the curriculum objectives when you look at the mark scheme. And these can be used as evidence that a child has mastered an objective. As you can see an example of a mark scheme, just a little corner at the bottom there, and the objective that each question refers to. So we still don't have any evidence after all that <clears throat> that Kevin has, has mastered this objective. In fact, we're now pretty sure that he hasn't. So whether it's a single objective or a whole group, given we've decided if this is an important piece of knowledge or important skill, you're probably going to want to teach it. And here there's normally two options. The first is focused intervention. Focused intervention is used if it's an individual or a small group that needs support. And generally it's structured around short sessions focused specifically on that single objective. And whoever's delivering it be checking understanding throughout and at the end through targeted questioning. With older, to older children this may also involve giving them the opportunity to prove that they can do it um, uh, written, uh, to, to provide written proof they can do it as well through a question, a short test or a written explanation. Um, however that's not always necessary and not always appropriate. The second option is whole class teaching. So for whole class teaching, this is appropriate if the whole class or the vast majority have similar needs or gaps. And it takes more time, but it covers more children. So it's, it's worth it if enough children need it. But either way, you might appreciate some support on ideas to teach those objectives. We definitely encourage you to adapt to the IPLS planning to meet your own needs. But as a first step, I'd suggest looking at the plans where those gaps were covered. So practically, just like we talked about, I've gone to the scheme of work for that missed teaching. I identified where the gap came up. Here it is, so year five, term two, week one. This is Kevin's week objective, all the objective we've got no evidence for. Um, we're pretty certain he can't do it. And now I've gone to the lesson plan. So if I just get back, we can see year five, turn two, week one. I've then found a specific lesson plan and I found where the objective is taught. So we can see it there. Um, if I'm teaching a small group, I'm going to use ideas from this plan to make my own questions and shorter interventions. 
if I'm teaching the whole class and I know they missed this lesson anyway, I'll just follow the plan or sequence of plans as appropriate. And then a few last pieces of practical advice. Um, so really importantly, don't do this alone. Agree an approach to identifying the gaps and addressing them as a team. Whether you use the ideas we've spoken about today or other ideas or baseline tests or whatever you decide is most appropriate, do involve your colleagues, talk about how you're going to find the data, talk about what you're going to do with it. Colleagues are absolutely invaluable in making decisions uh, and in assessing students. They can be colleagues teaching the same subject, the same age group, or simply fellow teachers in the school. The next two points go together. Involve senior leaders and explain what you're doing and why. Talk to senior leaders and get them on board with what you're doing. Senior leadership, especially in big schools, will have a lot going on and a very wide view. They're going to be as worried about gaps in learning as anyone though. Explain what you're doing and why and enlist their support. They're often um, a great source of experience and do appreciate being involved and consulted. Um, massive baseline tests and constant formal assessments are, as we've discussed, uh, fraught with problems, um, but do look like the right thing to do from the outside. So do involve them in your decisions. And whatever you do, do it together and support each other and the students. Explain to the students if needed, that you're simply trying to help them understand and do as well as they can in the future. And who can help? Everyone. <laughs> colleagues. We've spoken about colleagues at length. Um, they're a huge source of uh, information, knowledge, working collaboratively, knowing that other people in the same situation as you can be very helpful. Subject coordinators and senior leaders are often experienced teachers themselves and appreciate, uh, do appreciate explanations of how you're finding this data or why you're doing certain things as well. The students themselves, explain to them what you're doing, explain to them the reasoning, explain you're trying to help them. The next group is sometimes contentious, but parents. Um, parents are also very concerned for their children, as we know. And as we've spoken about again, from the outside, a baseline test or, or constant testing can look like the right thing to do, but does have its own problems and can be enormously hard to do a gaps analysis on such a huge test as well. Explain to parents how you're addressing the gaps and give them the confidence that you're supporting their students to move on. And then last, but hopefully not least, the iPrimary and iLower secondary materials that you've got access to on Active Learn Secondary and Active Learn Primary, the lesson plans, the curricula, the tests, and your local Pearson representatives and the central team here can all try and help you as well. And then finally, we might be able to help each other today as well. So, I'm going to take this opportunity to address some of the questions um, and open it up and see if anybody has anything to like clarification definitely on, fillers, definitely. any comments, or indeed if there's anything in their own school that they found to be really effective at this point. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we have a few questions come in in um wasim has asked a um a, a general question um in in terms of exams um so why is there a need of an exam in general um the reason for asking this is that students that are coming um, into the classrooms are from different cultures and communities they don't feel comfortable at the start when they're joining a new school um so is there another way that we can test their ability um, just because when they join, obviously they're facing difficulty in adjusting to the new school and then having to sit an exam can sometimes be a bit overwhelming. Any advice, please? Uh, yes. So, um, as, as you might have guessed, um, baseline tests and tests at the start of year do have their place and some people do really like them. Um, I really, really don't. <laughs> I, I think you're testing such a narrow little view anyway there and unless you make a huge test 
covering every conceivable objective, you're going to have gaps anyway. I would suggest talk to parents, talk to previous schools, talk to previous year groups and use the curriculum um, and try and identify through those conversations what they can already do. If you have access to their previous teacher, sit down with them with a copy of the curriculum or do so remotely and just say, well, let's have a look at Stacy. Let's have a look at the curriculum from last year. What do you know she can do? And take your fellow professional's word for it in that case. Um, pretty sure that after a few weeks in the class your own observations will add to this so if there's things they've forgotten there's things they teacher didn't know they could do but they can do these are all things you can amend on that curriculum document so i always used to keep a actually a folder in my classroom um, for each child with the curriculum documents in and i used to spend 10 minutes a day making amendments and i'd pick a different group each day you have to accept you're not going to have a complete picture of the very beginning, but you're not going to get that with a baseline test, as I say, unless you make them sit a five five hour test. I don't know if that's helpful at all. I believe so. Thank you, Kevin. I was speaking okay. and I realized I was on I was muted. Um, we have a, another question. Um, I think some of this might have been answered um, with, with the session itself. So one teacher has a concern um, in that there's been a drastic downfall in kind of learning and, and students actually attending classes, even virtual classes. Um, so for now, they're conduct conducting face to face classes, but they're the students that were absent, they're now having to revise um, any content that, that, that they've missed. So they're kind of asking around, how do you balance the level of revising or reviewing content that should have been learnt versus new content that students will need, need to learn? Um, and then the students obviously that have, have been present for the classes are now getting bored because they're having to revise the same content that they learned in, in virtual classes. Yeah. Do you have any advice for that, please? Uh, so I, I think we talked about some of that in the session. So I think part of it is having a look to see what they've missed and deciding whether it's important or not and making that fairly harsh decision of, I know, I know Stacey can conduct a fair test. So actually, I don't care that she didn't create a fair test last term for this one particular thing. Um, so you don't have to address everything you missed. Um, look at the curriculum document, identify what they can't do, and then identify what's dependent in the future. So maybe have a look at the, the lesson plans that you're teaching now or want to teach now, and have a look at the prior knowledge section. Um, if you're confident as a professional, don't worry about them having had the teaching, if you're confident as a professional that they have that prior knowledge, that they know these things already, don't worry about going back and just teaching things for the sake of it. At the same time, you are going to have some students who have separate gaps and um, have different gaps to others. And it might be that you do have to set different work there. So you might have a look at some of the plans to look at extension activities. You might potentially dip in and out of next year's activities as well for those more able students and set them independent activities while you focus on the students that need more targeted intervention. Um, that will mean you have a smaller group you're focusing on and you're able to move them on quicker to catch up with the rest, hopefully, as well. Oh, thank you. Um, there's a question around, do you think that the that flexibility can be shown in baseline assessments has, as learners have not been in a face-to-face -face classroom for quite some time? Um, I mean, again, if we're talking a formal baseline assessment, you've got to ask yourself why you're doing it. So if you're doing it to identify gaps, um, then you need to test you need to test absolutely everything they've missed if you're doing it for the sake of it um well i mean it, it then you don't do it don't do it um 
I think my worry with baseline assessments is if you're genuinely going to use them to create a gaps analysis, you do need to test absolutely everything. And they seem like an easy answer, but they're actually really inflexible. And as I say, these students have been in class for a while. We don't know whether the issue is going to be that they can't sit a three or four hour test, especially with young children. We don't know that they um, have simply forgotten how to be in school. I, I actually think for this kind of identifying gaps activity, you're much better with really short targeted focus tests if you have to. So like a really specific topic test on a topic you know they missed. So like the IPLS tests, the progress tests, the short ones might be useful for that, but also formative assessments. So those ideas we spoke about about observation and conversation. So observe what the child can do and can't do, uh, talk to the child, talk to their previous teacher. But a large baseline test is, unless your school's making you do it, is a fairly blunt instrument. Um, so I think, I think there absolutely should be flexibility about whether you do them or not. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for early years teachers? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, enjoy it. Um, so, well, I think early years, early years is in some ways ahead here because a lot of early years as it is, is purely formative. It's observation um, and it's, um, it's learning through activities and learning through doing. So hopefully, fingers crossed, um, really hoping here, hopefully nobody's asking earlier students to do a formal written baseline. And it's all through observation and conversation again. Um, I think my main advice with students of that age would be accept there's gaps, but they're at such a stage in their school education and they learn so quickly at that age that they are going to be made up really, really quickly. And they're used to more targeted carousel activities and focused intervention in small groups. Um, and generally for most earlier settings, it won't affect the way you teach that much, hopefully as well. Um, the only other thing I'd say for earlier settings is if you're doing it remotely um, and you find a way that works brilliantly, please let the rest of us know. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we've got some fantastic questions coming in um, and if we don't get round to answering them live, we will create an FAQ that will be attached to um, the recording of the session in the email that goes out later this week. Um, so be rest assured that we will get to your question, it just might not be in the session, so apologies. Um, so a few more, uh, Kevin, with children at different levels and experiencing different challenges, how does this affect class hours and workload? And then how as teachers, um, can they navigate this? Wow, um, that, that's a huge question, especially teaching yeah. remotely. Um, so I think, with all of these, a lot of, I, I think this applies to remote teaching and teaching in person as well. It's um, if you know exactly where each of the students are, so that curriculum tracking, that, that assessment, then you can focus your teaching on each group. You'll have to differentiate your teaching. It may be that there's times when most more able children are pushed to work independently and create their own work or create their own investigations um, or to do peer learning as well so that you can focus on the more disadvantaged students to give them the extra support to get them to catch up. Um, there's no easy answer here and simply throwing more work at the less able students is often quite demotivating. I think the number one thing we can do there is ensure that the work is accessible to them. So it might require rewording or rewriting. And if you, if possible, provide focused adult support, but not all the time, or you can create learned helplessness where they can't do things on their own. Um, I know that's a bit garbled for an answer, but really it, it, it's differentiation, it's focused activities with adults, and it's knowing exactly where they are. And it's also having the confidence to push other students to work independently as well. Thank you very much. Um, 
how do you address the gap with regards to practicals or implementations part during this pandemic? Um, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so, Toughy. yeah. So, I mean, most of my experiences in primary, so there's things I could do and would do with primary students, which might involve their own apartment, their own garden, um, family members. So I might set them a challenge to go and find something in the garden or to question a relative or um, to make something with their parents' help in the kitchen or with their support. I suspect one of the drivers of this question was practical element around things like IG or A-level. And in that case, um, I know some of the things that are being, doing, being done, so there's uh, helpful YouTube videos, tutorials we can watch, and uh, teachers setting up webcams so that they can actually do the practical with the student's guidance. So uh, doing it multiple times with small groups who actually direct them. So they're giving you the instruction in the practical. Um, there's no perfect way of doing it, but certainly for those higher stakes examination years, I know the fact that the practical element is very difficult at the moment is being taken into account uh, when examinations are being looked at. Thank you. Um, and we do, there is a concern um, from one teacher that they, if they can't finish their teaching according to the lesson plans, um, as they've got new students who can't follow the lesson properly, even though teachers have provided extra online classes for them, do you have any advice? Um, yeah, so you strip the lessons back if you have to. Um, focus on the objective. Uh, use the lesson plan as a base. And if you know your students really, really well and you can think of another way of addressing it um, or a way that's more closely linked to their own experiences or context, by all means adapt it. Um, also, don't be afraid to split your class as well. So if you think, and this links into formative assessment. So if during the lesson, say half of your children have definitely got it, set them some reading, set them an extension, and then you can turn your attention to the half that haven't and provide more focused teaching there. And if it's simply a matter of doing all the activities in a lesson, but you think the children have already got the point of it, don't worry about finishing it just for the sake of it. Just check their understanding and move on. Okay, so a few more. So if anyone's got any more burning questions that they really want to ask, uh, please do pop them in the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll try and get round to them. If not, we'll send an FAQ with unanswered questions answered in an email later this week. So there is a question from a teacher, how can we conduct tests um, that will avoid copying cheating effectively? Um, online? Um, you can't. Um, if, if it's online, unless you demand the child turns on their webcam and you watch them the whole time, um, which I have heard of schools doing, but I wouldn't condone, um, there's no real way other than trust for you to know that they don't have somebody else there with them. Um, what would help in this case, if it's not a high stakes examination or an end of year, is explaining to the child, depends on age and temperament and what the child's like, and explain to the parent, whoever else might be there as well, why you're doing it. Explain, this is so you can get the help you need. There's no point. Um, I probably wouldn't use cheating because that immediately gets people annoyed, but there's no point getting someone else to help you because then later on you'll find yourself in a situation where you have to do this alone and you don't understand. It's fine to not know and this is so that I know what I have to do to help you. Try and explain it that way to them. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, another question around, around tests. Um, when we say short tests, do we mean in terms of questions um, or time or both? And would open-ended perspective-based questions be more appropriate, especially when it comes to language? Uh, yes, yes and yes. 
So um, to be honest, when we talk about tests in this context, if it's a single objective I'm looking for evidence for, the test might just consist of me saying, Stacy, explain how I divide by 100. <laughs> That's it. Um, if it's a slightly longer one, well, IPLS has the short topic tests, which are linked to um, objectives, but equally you can create your own. I mean, you're all um, experienced professionals, care about your job. Have a look at the curriculum uh, or the specifications, if it's a language. Have a look at the thing you're trying to check and think, how could I check this? What question could I ask? And open ended questions are I, I think great harder to mark but can tell us a lot including information we're not necessarily looking for but yeah keep it short keep it focused thank you and there's there seems to be quite a pertinent question um around covid and, and home learning so a teacher has asked how can we keep the objectives if our students have different levels of learning environments um, do you have any advice on, on that? Um, so you might, I mean, it depends how structured or how set your school's approach to it is. So it might be that some students require extra support and this could be in the form of doing things like emailing them, um, emailing them things to look at in advance, pre-teaching vocabulary, so send them through words they need to know so they're able to access it quicker. Um, it could be providing follow-up support um, or saying office hours, like I will check my email between three o'clock and 3.30, I will get back to you as soon as possible. And if your school's amenable to it, it can also mean, it could also mean that you split classes. So it could be that you say, rather than having an hour online, all of you there in a Zoom call with me, I'm actually going to do 30 minutes of focused work with half the class and 30 minutes focused work with the other half. And during the other 30 minutes, they're not with you, they're working independently. Be creative about what you're doing. And most of the things you might be able to do in class anyway, you can do on a Zoom call or on Teams. Um, and those things like providing vocabulary marks, providing extra sheets, you can definitely do those online as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and kind of related to that question, how can we overcome the challenge of multimodality in e-learning as every learner learns differently? Um, okay, every learner does learn differently. So, but you can still provide them with, different ways of experiencing things and I know I know there's limits to this especially when you're not with them in person but um, I would say I spoke earlier about the idea of getting them to look at things practically within their house and move away from the computer don't be afraid of that so give them a break give them five minutes to go and find an example of something you're talking about in an environment or ask questions of a sibling um, or I'm sure you'll find something more creative in this, but go and count the number of books in the bookcase if there's a reason for it. Um, so that they can actually move away, they can look at stuff, they can listen to someone else talking, they can physically touch stuff if need be, um, and have different options there as well. Um, some things like Teams, like Zoom, you can set up little breakout groups, you can still do group work in there as well. So you've all joined a Teams meeting today, with your class, why not set up several multiple Teams meetings and say from two till half to this group's in this meeting, this group's in this, and you can drop in and out of those and trust them to work together as well. You've got to be creative and you've got to try some things and some things won't work for your students and some things will, but do try, try to make it different because otherwise we do get to the point where we're, we're just sat on a Zoom call talking to some, talking at someone. Oh, thank you very much. Um, there are a few more questions, but they relate to kind of uh, questions that you've just answered or, or answered throughout. Do you have any closing advice um, for for everyone on this call before we um, end this session? Um, 
yes, and I think I said it about four times, but uh, talk to your colleagues. Um, this is unprecedented. It's different. In some ways, it's exciting the rapidity of digital change we're seeing, but it's, it's also quite overwhelming. Um, everybody's going to have similar feelings and thoughts, share ideas. It could be that the massively experienced teacher down the corridor has some brilliant things they're doing and equally the newly qualified teacher might have some things you're not aware of. All of that sharing of ideas that happened when you're in school together just by being near people isn't happening now unless we make it happen. So talk to your colleagues. That's it. Sorry, I'd started talking again whilst I was still on mute. Um, <laughs> seems to happen more often than not that, doesn't it now? Um, so I just want to say thank you, Kevin, for um, guiding us through this session. I hope it was useful um, and people, people attending the session were able to take something away um, from it. You, as we mentioned earlier, you will be receiving a recording of this session, um, a feedback form relating to both this session and any other sessions that you, you might like to see in the future, um, and also a certificate of attendance. Kevin has popped up um, the uh, Pearson International Schools website, so if you do have any queries or you want to take a look at the website regarding resources, please do go ahead. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending, um, and if you do have any other questions, you can um, send a, um, a question via the, the Zoom invitation link. It will send a, a question directly to me and we can get, get it answered for you. Um, but other than that, thank you, Kevin, and thank you to everyone for attending. And I hope everyone has a lovely rest of their day. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>